Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Robert Boyd, who's the CEO and director of Endurance Gold Corporation, um, who are a project generator, um, exploration company, exploring for gold and rare earth projects in British Columbia, Alaska, and the Yukon. Uh, Robert's a mining executive with a background in geology, expanding over 40 years and holds many board positions, uh, one of them being uh, a board director for PDAC, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, um, and also the Canadian Hall of Fame. Today, um, Robert's going to give us an update of uh, update on Endurance Gold Corp um, and discuss many more topics in the world of mining. So I'd like to welcome Robert to the podcast. How are you doing, Robert? Very good. Thank you, Rob, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this. I look forward to giving an update. Yeah, and I appreciate you taking your your time out of your day to do this as well. Um, as we always start these podcasts, I wonder if you can give us um, a, a background about your career. Obviously, those um, and in Canada and beyond will will know of you, um, but those that are listening around the world, whether that's Australia, in Europe. Uh, for those that don't know you, just well, let me just give us a, a, a brief overview of your of your your career and your background. Uh, sure, Rob. Uh, well, my roots are Australia. Actually, I was born there, uh, but moved to Canada when I was five years old. And uh, and uh, part of the reason I got into the mineral exploration was because my dad was a dentist. And so you go, well, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, so uh, anyways, when he sold his dental practice with his young family to move to Canada, he, uh, there were exchange controls at the time in the early 50s, and, uh, and he went to the opal mines, bought some opals up there, and uh, used uh, the proceeds of the sale of his dental practice to buy opals, brought them over to Canada, made a lot of money at it, and said, hey, this is better than dentistry, and none of the business of importing gems. Uh, uh, so ultimately... Uh, uh, because of that, we, we got to know, uh, uh, as a family, uh, uh, Newfoundlander, who was uh, a lapidary uh, for cutting a lot of uh, opals and other things like that that my dad imported. And, uh, and he was a weekend prospector, a mineral collector. And so my brother and I, I'm an identical twin, uh, we got into really uh, getting out and fossicking and hunting for uh, mineral specimens as young boys and that gave us the quest that uh, ultimately resulted in me becoming a geologist and a gemologist uh, but I spent my whole career in the in the exploration business primarily as a geologist uh, with uh, exploring for gold uh, but also diamonds um, uh, potash uh, all kinds of other commodities including rare earths and uh, uh, so I've, I've got a varied career. Uh, so my specialty as, an, as, an in, as a geologist is the, uh, is the business of mineral exploration. And uh, I spent about 10 years with Homestake, which was where the, the, the key, uh, my key gold experience came from. And then I did a little bit of investment banking for a while. And then I was the president to come back to the connections to Australia. I was the president of Ashton Mining of Canada uh, for a while. And we discovered the Renard... Uh, a diamond deposit in Quebec, which is still, which is now a producing a diamond mine in the province of Quebec. Uh, that, uh, as Ashton Mining of Canada was ultimately sold and became part of Stornoway Diamonds, and that was the Stornoway Diamond story in Quebec was that that discovery. So, um, uh, so that so that crossed into my uh, <laughs> had a little bit of overlap between the mineral exploration business and uh, and my and my gemology background. Um, but uh, after uh, leaving um, Ashton, I joined a few boards. I was on the board of directors of Peregrine Diamonds, uh, and, and I was the lead director for Peregrine Diamonds, which was acquired by De Beers a few years ago uh, for another diamond discovery up in Canada's Arctic. Uh, and uh, also joined for a very brief period of time the, the, the board and was the president of a company called Athabasca Potash, which was sold, brought, uh, BHP came in around the time I was there and, uh, and the company was sold to BHP is now part of their Janssen project uh, in Canada. So I, I have a, a bit of experience uh, 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 building companies and then seeing uh, them sold. Um, and so now with uh, Endurance, Endurance has been around since 2005. I was not part of the founding uh, group, but came in as a director uh, uh, in 2008 or so, 
uh, and then uh, became the president and CEO in 2010 when the, the founding CEO unfortunately passed away. Uh, and uh, Endurance is a prospect generator uh, type company, but, uh, and so in the past we've generated opportunities, but we do what's in the best interests of, of shareholders. Uh, so we acquired this project that we're working on now called the Reliance Project in British Columbia in late 2019, did our first program in 2020. But we've had such encouraging success on it that we feel it's best interest, the best in interest for shareholders are to invest our own dollars, raise funds and, and explore this and develop and take it as long and as far as we can possibly take it uh, uh, through exploration uh, and mine development if necessary. So, uh, um, so it's a, a good project. Endurance is a company um, uh, has about 135 million shares issued and outstanding, and uh, we are tightly held, uh, three of the insiders, including two uh, founding uh, directors, uh, own about 55% uh, of the issued and outstanding shares, despite the long history of the company. Uh, we funded it uh, through the tough times, and, uh, and now with the success uh, uh, of the Reliance project, uh, we've moved up in our market capitalization to, I think it's about the 55 or 60 million Canadian range uh, from about 5 million uh, market cap for a few years ago uh, when we first acquired the project. Um, the Reliance project is, uh, is located only a four hour summer drive north of Vancouver um, and in, in, the, in the summer because then you can go, you, drive up through Whistler and then Pemberton and then go over the, through the pass, which is only open during the summer. And then it's a longer six hour drive uh, in the off season through Lillooet. Uh, and, uh, but it's, and it's located right in the Gold Bridge Braylon camp, uh, which was first uh, prospected and discovered in the Fraser River Gold Rush in the 1860s. And the first hard rock claims in, their, in our district were, were acquired in the uh, 1890s. And, uh, the Braylorn Pioneer Mine, I think there's three different mines that form that complex, uh, uh, produced between 1930 and 1970, from the 1930s and the 1970s, have produced over 4 million ounces of gold. Uh, and it remains the largest uh, gold uh, producer in the province of British Columbia. And it's an orogenic type gold system. The project we've got uh, is not part of that trend, but it's on a parallel structure in one of these orogenic uh, structural settings. And it's a new discovery on surface uh, that did see a bit of work uh, historically uh, by prospectors in the pre-war era, maybe uh, in the early 1900s, uh, chasing narrow uh, stibnite gold veins uh, and uh, copying those and sending them off to smelters, but very small production. The, the largest small producer on our, on our land position produced maybe 1,600 ounces of gold uh, but the discovery we're on to was actually one of the prospects that only had a small bit of work, uh, some hand carving. Uh, and, um, but the, when we acquired the project in 2020, it had never had a, a gold and soil survey completed on it. So we uh, started to do the systematic work. And, uh, and although there was a, a gold intersection on the property, uh, we quickly uh, um, translated this good systematic exploration with geophysics and everything through good, uh, uh, well-orchestrated exploration program that resulted in the discovery of a new zone now, which is the, the, the area of success that we've had where we've now picked up gold intersections over about 435 meters of strike within an overall gold system where we've got gold and bedrock now in excess of 1.5 kilometers of strike, including, um, uh, Really, really good intersections like uh, fifteen point seven grams over 20, 24 meters. Uh, we're more recently we've announced holes this morning where we had uh, intersections like four grams over thirty meters and uh, eight grams over thirteen meters. So, so really, really encouraging uh, system that we've identified up in this upper four hundred and thirty five meter trend, which we call the Eagle Zone, uh, and. Uh, it's a high level orogenic type gold system. Uh, so it's in a brittle, brittle uh, deformation regime. So it doesn't look like gray line. It's not a crack and seal vein with visible gold. It's a sulfide breccia and sulfidization uh, of, uh, 
of the, the altered host rocks. And so you, you've got a zone that when it outcrops on surface just looks like a really orange colored muck. Uh, it doesn't look like a vein or anything, but it, it carries a significant gold. And these historic forestry roads in the area were overlooked. Uh, the sapling of these road cuts. And uh, we just did that systematic work, including sapling the road cuts and found this zone daylighting on surface and followed it now for 435 meters of strike and it's still open. And now we're transitioning uh, from a shallow dipping structure, uh, which was easy to follow on surface into now a more steeper feature that looks like the feeder features. We're just transitioning into that with our recent diamond drilling program, which has started to uh, a little over a month ago now, and uh, we've got, uh, I think, 15 holes, 15 diamond drill holes completed. Uh, and uh, we've uh, uh, disclosed uh, assay results on six of those uh, uh, 16 holes that we've got completed this year. And then we did a short program late last year, which was the first diamond drilling program, which re returned very good results as well. So we're early days in the discovery of a, a pretty interesting new gold uh, discovery in, in an historic uh, plus four million ounce gold camp. So we feel this, this project has the potential to generate uh, uh, a plus million ounce discovery, possibly a multi-million ounce discovery like Braylord and represents the epizonal or shallow level orogenic exposure of possibly a Braylord type system at depth. So, so, so that's where we are now. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, we are continuing with our program. Uh, we've got about three thousand meters of a planned eight thousand meter program completed this year, and uh, so we expect to be able to drill right through the fall. This is a very road accessible property. Everything we're drilling is right off the road. Uh, the property itself is only four kilometers from the town of Goldbridge, and so you can drive right onto the property from a. Uh, from the town of Goldbridge. So we could work the property year round. Uh, to date, we've worked right through till December and then started up again in March. Uh, but we have the possibility of working right through the, the year because if it's road accessible, then you can plow the roads if there is any snow issues. So, so it's, a, it's a great project and a good location uh, in an historic camp. And uh, uh, we're, uh, we're having a very good success ratio on our drill, drill intersections with a very high percentage of them, something like 80% of them have gold, gold intersections uh, and uh, probably 15 or 15 or 20% of those have exceptional gold intersections. So it's uh, very encouraging uh, to get this kind of uh, statistics in the early days of an exploration program. Yeah, sounds it. Um... Can you give us a bit of a history around the Goldbridge Braylawn Gold District? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, this this area was opened up, um, uh, you know, the, the traditional. Uh, there was the Statley and First Nation uh, uh, um, individuals lived up in the valley called the Upper Bridger Valley uh, even before the first uh, the Fraser River Gold Rush. And it was some of those uh, uh, Statley and First Nation members that actually guided some of the uh, original uh, placer miners uh, that went up the, up the Fraser River and then right up the Bridge River because the Bridge River seemed to have a lot of gold in it. And we're in the upper Bridge River drainage. Uh, and uh, they followed the gold up into that camp and the first hard rock claims in and around us within about four kilometers of us were, were uh, located in 1890. Um, and uh, so they ultimately, they were chasing placer gold, but then they started finding gold in bedrock in 1890 in our camp. Uh, and we have one prospect on our property very close to the, the zone we're drilling that, that, that had some reported production of hand cob veins in, in 1917. Uh, that's the only records that we could identify of some hand cob veins. And then um, this area uh, was the upper bridge of a It was flooded in the early 1950s uh, and, it, and is now a BC Hydro Reservoir. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, and that's the, the area that feeds the hydroelectric power for a lot of the lower mainland in, in, uh, in British Columbia, our power source. And there is another dam just about five kilometers from our property 
it has another reservoir behind that. So we've got hydro uh, uh, hydropower available to us locally. It's already serviced in the camp for the local hydropower, but we have the advantage of an existing hydropower facility that helped uh, service the original Braylon Pioneer Mine, but also could service uh, us if, if necessary. Uh, so it's it's a very well, uh, great area. Uh, the, the Gold Bridge, um, so, so this, you know, this part of the, the, the whole camp was discovered as part of the original Fraser River Gold Rush, but our property in particular uh, had some work done on it in the mid 1980s. And the, the interesting thing there is the gentleman that owned it through a junior company at the time, he, he had a, a non-traditional way of, uh, of locating drill holes. He was a dowser uh, and uh, sometimes would locate uh, uh, his drill holes by dousing or a, a Ouija board type approach on his kitchen table. And uh, But to give him credit, he was successful and made a, 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 had a good intersection on one area of the property, which is not an area we're actively exploring right now, but we will go back to and got a good, good, um, some good results, uh, but then when he followed up on it, he just tended to follow up or within around 100 meters of that uh, original drill intersection, never really followed out and did the systematic work on the property uh, to identify uh, the, the rest of the gold zones and open up the system to, to one and a half to two kilometer strike length, which we've done with systematic work uh, uh, all in the last uh, two to three years. Um, uh, so it was. Uh, um, so the area had a lot of interest in the past, just because it was an existing gold camp. But uh, it's never been adequately explored until we uh, stepped onto it in in twenty in nineteen in in twenty twenty and started uh, doing a systematic program on it. Um, obviously, you've been in the um, exploration space uh, for for a long time. One, let me just give us your thoughts on. Uh, the junior exploration space, especially within Canada and, and beyond, and what your thoughts are as we are in 2022, and, and what, where, where you see the exploration space headed towards? Uh, Canada, um, Canada is sort of one of the countries in the world that produces really good uh, entrepreneurial uh, geologists and, and, and business sector that's good at um, and we've got a, a financing structure here in Canada that creates an opportunity for, for junior mining companies to, to raise venture capital because we, we as a company are venture capitalized. We have no earnings. Uh, so we have to re rely on raising money to do exploration and delivering wealth uh, to our shareholders through that uh, venture capital wealth. And to, and one could say we've been very successful at that in the last couple of years in terms of going from a 5 million market cap to a roughly 60 million market cap right now. And there's still room to move if, if we can continue to demonstrate that this system can get bigger uh, if we have that exploration success. Uh, so Canada is well positioned uh, uh, as a country to, to, to do that. And most of our, our uh, uh, political regimes are pretty friendly uh, to uh, to mineral exploration in Canada. BC is particularly encouraging, no, no matter which whether you've got a left leading or right leading government. Uh, and I think it's fair to say most of the provinces uh, uh, across uh, Canada are similarly similarly inclined. Quebec, in particular, is very entrepreneurially entrepreneurial in terms of encouraging exploration through different incentives and, and BC and every province does that. So it's a great country to explore. And so we've seen a lot of exploration dollars raised also through tax driven financing, like the flow through transactions. And here in BC, for every dollar we spend, we get about a 30 cent tax credit back on those exploration qualifying exploration dollars that that's not even flow through. But if we did flow through, there's also that methodology for raising money. So there's a lot of different methodologies that encourage investment in, in, the, um, in making new discoveries here in Canada. I think we, we as Canadian explorers are very well positioned and we often take that knowledge around the world in exploring, just like some of the Australian companies do. And we see a lot of Australians here in Canada. Uh, there's been a time and there still is where there's Canadian companies in Australia. So we're both, uh, entrepreneurial 
uh, and very capable exploration uh, uh, countries that generate very good exploration companies. So uh, right now it's a little tough market uh, for junior mining companies. Uh, it's a tough equity market uh, um, because of the overall uncertainties uh, in the economies around the world. Uh, but we, uh, but we are well positioned uh, to feed the green economy with our the requirements for copper and other uh, strategic uh, metals. Uh, and uh, with the inflationary and money printing environment, uh, uh, gold companies are well positioned because they could feed into that need uh, for uh, um, gold as a as a traditional store of wealth. Uh, you mentioned obviously entrepreneurial. There, there seems to be a lot of obviously entrepreneurial type geologists within Canada. Why would you say why would you say that Canada produces these types of people and maybe Australia compared to other countries? Is, uh, is it something that the, the mining industry sort of encourages within Canada more so than other other countries around the world? Uh I, I would say um, we have a financial and exploration environment and community in Canada, uh, rural community in particular in Canada that understands the benefits of mining and what it can bring to them in terms of jobs and wealth. I'm, I'm sure we're like any other uh, places around the world that often the urban environment doesn't understand the importance of mining uh, uh, to them. Uh, and the importance of mineral exploration because mineral exploration is the R&D of mining. And if you don't have mineral exploration and you're not making discoveries, you don't have a sustainable business. So, uh, so I think we really understand that here in Canada and you've got to create an environment that uh, gives entrepreneurs, um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and investors uh, the opportunity that they invest uh, wisely with good management on good projects uh, uh, that there's an opportunity for significant uh, uh, returns uh, for them. And so that kind of investment environment uh, is very well established in Canada uh, and well regarded and, uh, and it supports entrepreneurial uh, geologists and, uh, and mining engineers and others that uh, can and they, they can build our business. And, uh, and there's been some great success stories uh, uh, in Canada. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit about some of the other companies that you're involved with? Sure. Um, well, I, I did mention I was on the board at one time of Peregrine Diamonds. And uh, uh, at the present time, I'm also on the board of a company called Condor Resources, who's, who's uh, solely focused in Peru. It's an early stage exploration company uh, with a good portfolio of projects in Peru. Uh, but, uh, at, but at the present time, we haven't been doing a lot of exploration on those uh, drilling type exploration on those projects, but it's a good portfolio. And our goal is to, is to continue to advance those. So, so that's an early stage a small market capitalized junior company that I'm involved with. Um, uh, then, um, so that's the only other uh, public company that I'm currently involved with. Uh, uh, and then I'm on the board of directors on the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, and, and I've been a long time director there. And then was on the board of directors of uh, the Association of Mineral Exploration BC here for many years be before that and overlapping with my directorship of PDAC. Um, my directorship at PDAC is uh, I serve on the governance committee and the, uh, the awards committee and, um, and the conference planning committee for the PDAC conference every year. Uh, PDAC is more than its conference. Uh, we're a, a significant lobbying organization with the, with the Canadian government and the provincial uh, governments across uh, Canada to ensure that the regulatory regime is there to encourage the creation of new wealth uh, in Canada. Uh, so we've, we've lobbied all, continuously over the years for flow through shares and other, other types of uh, incentives that encourage exploration activity in Canada and invite investors into our business. Uh, as a result of my role at PDAC, uh, you did mention the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. I serve on the board of that. And, and the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, its members are, are different associations uh, that feed potential candidates 
into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame that may have been uh, already recognized by, say, the PDAC or Mining Association of Canada. Uh, but if we recognize these, some of these candidates that feel well, maybe they should actually be considered for the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, then we, then we as different associations that are members of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame uh, provide candidates and then the board of directors uh, considers those candidates uh, every year. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been to PDAC and uh, yeah, what a great event that is. Um, you're, like you mentioned, you're a board member of the Canadian Hall of Fame. And obviously, every year you enter people onto that uh, uh, Hall of Fame. What is some of the criteria that you as an organisation is looking for when you're, I suppose, shortlisting uh, mining professionals for, for that award to be on the, the Hall of Fame? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not really a spokesman for the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, so I, I'm a little uncomfortable being put on the spot with that question, but I think that the, the we have a very we have a very good protocol uh, outline for anybody that wants to submit applications through uh, through the website. But typically, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the different as member associations uh, have their own protocols internally uh, for identifying uh, candidates that they would move up there, and they would typically, obviously, be people that have, have been very successful in the Canadian mining and mineral exploration and finance business. So it goes right across the broad range. Uh, 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 for instance, uh, we've, we've had one inductee this year that's been very involved in mining education uh, and educating our, our young. Uh, and another one that, uh, another inductee that, that was an extremely important metallurgist uh, that uh, was, uh, that drove uh, innovation in metallurgy uh, uh, through Canadian and a Canadian at that uh, that uh, created technologies that are used around the world now, and of course in our business uh, the great entrepreneurs in mineral exploration that have found and discovered and built built mining uh, mining and mineral exploration companies around discoveries that they've uh, identified and built and financed. So, so it's, uh, it's so that's generally it's uh, people we regard as our peers that we think are our role models uh, for what we want to, to see uh, 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 forever recognized in the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. One thing, you have to be, yeah. one thing I can say is you have to be over 65. <laughs> 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 so we don't put young guys in there. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, of course, obviously there has to be an age limit to obviously have that background and experience and um, obviously results orientated to uh, to get to uh, to get be put into the Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you see the the mining industry developing over the sort of the next decade? Well, uh, I think um, the green economy is good for mining. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've had many people on here that mentioned the need. Uh, that for electric cars, the requirements that, that are going to need for the inputs for those electric cars are dramatically larger than they are for traditional vehicles, especially for copper and, and the battery related minerals. Uh, so then that's good for, for, uh, for mining because that really needs to feed that economy. And, uh, and then what, what we have to do is make sure we do it in an environmentally conscious manner and, and uh, focus on uh, the environment, the communities, uh, and uh, and of course, uh, carbon uh, or carbon footprint uh, issues as well. So, I think it's uh, it's good for the business. Uh, we're we're uh, although I'm 70 years old, I represent a younger generation that's very sensitive to what we 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 are doing and and have done in the uh, uh, in our exploration activities and our mining activities. Uh, so. I think we're very socially conscious of business uh, in general, especially Canadians um, uh, and Australians and Americans. So we, we have the right kind of environment, uh, psyche to build and run and want to be involved with companies that do the right thing. And lastly, and the conclusion, um, what's the outlook for Endurance Gold over the sort of next six to 12 months? 
Well, we're we're actively exploring. I think we're about three thousand meters into a planned eight thousand meter drill program, and uh, our success our success ratio so far in our drilling has been pretty pretty high. Uh, so we uh, anticipate uh, uh, with the continued drilling that we're doing now that we'll be able to deliver encouraging results uh, through to the end of the year uh, in a very consistent basis, and hopefully be able to demonstrate. Uh, uh, to ourselves and to the public that we're building uh, a bigger and bigger gold system here. Yeah, Robert, really appreciate your time. Uh, good luck with the, uh, the project, uh, Endurance. Um, and if our audience wants to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, obviously you have a wealth, wealth of knowledge, um, but I suppose more concentrated on um, endurance. How can they go about doing that? Are you across any social media platforms? Well, of course, I'm. I, I have a, a LinkedIn profile and uh, uh, and a, a Twitter profile, but so does the company. Uh, for as far as the company is concerned, uh, they can reach us uh, through uh, www.endurancegold.com. It's pretty straightforward, uh, and uh, you can link into all of our social media uh, platforms uh, through our website and identify them there. So. Or if you want to follow uh, what we're doing, uh, just uh, let us know uh, through info at endurancegold.com and we'll make sure you get on our email list. Yeah. Uh, so we, we hope to look forward with it to, to keep uh, a, a busy program going and uh, lots of news coming out uh, through the coming year. Yeah, and we'll include those in the show notes as well accompanying this podcast. So really wish you uh, well in the future. Really appreciate your time. Uh, you have um, obviously have a wealth of experience and, and I really wish you well in the project. No doubt you will get the results that you're, that you're seeking. So um, yeah. like I said, really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Rob, and thank you uh, for, uh, for listening. So. Yeah, no, thank you. And our, our audience, the ones that are also listening to this, I um, hope you got a lot of uh, information from there. Um, and obviously, please look up Endurance. Um, they will obviously have a, a great prospect there and a great project. So I um, pr- appreciate you uh, reaching out to Robert or his company if you have any questions. So until next time, happy mining.